Humans and the Environment, Unit 2. So in Unit 1, we spent a lot of time talking about biogeochemical cycles, and we talked about energy processing, and we talked about a lot of the abiotic components of the ecosystem, and we discussed the biotic components of the ecosystem, the living plants and animals and decomposers, the fungi and bacteria, and all of those kind of components. We limited our discussion to food chains and energy flow and their feeding relationships, but in Unit 2, we're going to get into a lot more depth uh, of describing the living components of the ecosystems, the specific types of jobs that different organisms can fulfill inside of an ecosystem, uh, and the variety of different ways that they can fulfill those jobs, and the variety of different organisms. The variety of species in an area is referred to as the biodiversity. So diversity talks about variety, right? That, that's what diversity means, having lots and lots of different types of things, a, a good mix of different types of stuff. Bio, uh, referring to biology, so the biological diversity of an area refers to how many different types of organisms you have. Or you could describe the uh, ecosystem biodiversity of a landscape, how many different types of ecosystems you have in that area. Or you could talk about the genetic biodiversity, the genetic diversity of a particular species. Uh, are they all very, very homogenous, which would indicate a, a high amount of inbreeding in that population? Or are they very diverse? Are there lots and lots and lots of different traits uh, available in this population? In general, uh, and go ahead and write this down. This will be the first good note for you to take. Uh, high biodiversity means a healthier ecosystem. The more variety of traits and species and kinds of places and, and organisms that a uh, landscape has or a location has, uh, the more resilient that ecosystem is going to be to any kind of pollution that comes through, to any kind of disturbance that comes through, storms or wildfires or, or uh, humans coming through and, and uh, doing development projects, whatever it is, they'll be able to bounce back much easier if there's a high biodiversity. And you'll see why in a little bit. Now you see a second term up here, which is evolution. And evolution and biodiversity are inextricably tied together because the way that we get new species is through evolutionary processes. Life has existed on Earth for 3.5 billion years, and there are millions of species of plants and animals. Now, so far, we've only talked about processes that would drive populations towards extinction, right? If you destroy a natural habitat, that's going to lower the quality of an ecosystem. It's going to make it harder for a population to survive, for a species to survive, and then that population might be driven towards extinction. So that would cause us to lose species from that number. The, the total number of species would go down and down and down and down. And every wildfire that comes through, every time we do habitat destruction, every bit of pollution, every little disturbance to an ecosystem would start driving that number down. Every Every time one species increases in number and outcompetes another one, right, it would drive that other species to extinction and you would get, you know, one would, would take over that, that little section of the ecosystem, but another one would start disappearing. So if you have a large number of species and you only have these processes which drive species to extinction, you would expect the number of species on Earth to shrink over time. But if you look through the fossil record, that is not what happens the number of species goes up and down and up and down and up and down. Overwhelmingly, the trend is for, over time, the number of species on Earth to increase and increase and increase and increase. The variety of species and traits and types of organisms to increase over time, and then some sort of mass extinction event will reduce the number all at once. Think the comet that uh, took out the dinosaurs, right? That's the one we're all familiar with, the big uh, asteroid that hits the Yucatan Peninsula and, and throws all that rock and soot up into the atmosphere. Uh, that, that's one of the mass extinction events. There are five major mass extinction events in the fossil record, and we are currently uh, undergoing the sixth mass extinction event. Uh, the number of species that we are losing uh, on a daily basis is similar to that that you would see in any of these other uh, massive mass extinctions, and this one is driven primarily from human activities. Uh, mass extinctions don't happen all in an instant. They happen over the course of many, many years, and that's exactly what we're seeing. But uh, 
I digress, the process that adds more species to the total number that are found on Earth is evolution. That's how we get new types of organisms. Without it, the total number of species on Earth would have been driven down and down and down and down over time. We only would have ever seen fewer and fewer and fewer types of organisms. So we will talk in detail about how evolution works. The short version is that as a population grows, uh, every organism that is born in that population can have little mutations, li little changes to their DNA. And it always happens. There are always mutations. Every single one of you has some mutations in your DNA that your parents didn't have. Those traits might be uh, useful or not useful or neutral. They might have no effect on you whatsoever. If you happen to be born with some trait that makes you really good at gathering food or really good at hiding from predators or uh, really good, really attractive to other mates uh, or really good at caring for your offspring, right? You, it means that you're uh, just for, for whatever reason able to protect your offspring better or you're more nurturing or you know, any other number of different traits that would translate to you having more offspring, uh, more mates, more... Uh, success feeding your offspring, more success feeding yourself, and therefore being able to spend more time caring for your offspring, whatever it is, some traits are going to uh, end up giving you a higher statistical number of offspring. So in this title image, I have a bat and a moth. So let's say that this bat uh, has a mutation which makes its hearing a little bit more sensitive. And that means that its echolocation is a little bit better. Bats hunt prey by sending out sound waves from their voice, and then that sound wave bounces off whatever's in front of them, and it hits their ears, and they're able to pinpoint where there's a physical object in front of them, and that's how they're able to hunt at night, right? So having this little mutation which causes their hearing mechanism to be a little bit more sensitive, which in some cases you could imagine would be a negative, but in this case it might actually help them with their hunting behavior, is going to make it a more precise hunter, and maybe this allows the bat to be able to gather more food. This would make it a healthier uh, bat. It's, it's able to you know gather its food a lot easier, uh, put on enough calories, and therefore it can spend more of its time searching for mates, and it could have more offspring. And it could bring more food to its offspring. It might be able to produce more milk for its offspring, because bats, after all, are mammals, so those offspring would get more nutrition uh, and be healthier themselves. So they would have a higher chance of survival as well, and therefore that trait of, of better hearing would be passed on to its offspring, and they would become a larger share of the next generation's gene pool uh, than any competitors who were less likely to survive up to adulthood. Meanwhile, this moth, uh, it also is, is undergoing evolutionary processes. In the entire population of moths, some of them are going to have mutations which change their flight behavior to maybe make it more erratic. Uh, Little, little nuances that make it harder for bats to be able to pinpoint them and, and lock on. The ones with the best flight patterns, which are going to be genetically determined because uh, you know, insects don't have a lot of um, higher cognition to like plan things out, so they're a little bit more robotic in their, in their motions. Uh, the ones with the, with the most evasive flight maneuvers are going to be the ones that survive. So as the bats are eating, they're going to eat all of the ones that have um, very simple flight maneuvers, and the only surviving moths are going to be the ones that are more difficult to eat. Therefore, those are going to be the only moths that reproduce, and the next generation are going to have those more complicated flight patterns, so the entire population will evolve in that direction. So mutations can give you new types of traits, and then this competition and, and uh, predator-prey relationship and mate selection and all that kind of stuff, which we call natural selection, determines which of those traits will actually be useful uh, for the population. And when I say useful, I mean, does it increase the number of surviving offspring uh, that that organism happens to have? But we'll talk in detail about how evolution works coming in. So biodiversity evolution. We're going to talk about some of the roles that, e that uh, organisms play in their ecosystems. It is a, uh, it's going to be a really interesting unit. I love unit two. So 
Life is weird and that is beautiful. That's what I've titled this slide. You can take a look at the diversity of organisms that we have up here at the top. I have some bacteria over here on the left. Then we have a fungi, a beautiful fungi with this veil uh, going over it. We have the star-nosed mole right here. We have a lovely plant. We have some uh, some algae here that is encased in glass. It's a it's a diatom, a kind of algae that makes a little glass uh, coating for itself. Uh, there's a lot of really unusual organisms around the world, and any any kind of environment that you can imagine, life has found a way to live there. And sometimes the adaptations that are required to survive and thrive in those locations are strange and bizarre looking to our eyes, but they are awesome. They are, and I mean awesome in the original sense of the world, like inspiring awe. They are really cool to look at. Uh, so life is weird and that is beautiful. There, there are so many strange species around the world and the variety of different organisms is referred to as biodiversity and it can describe a number of different things. So we have genetic diversity which describes the genetic variation amongst individuals within each species. We have species diversity which describes the number of species in a given ecosystem or a given area. Uh, it is estimated that Earth is home to 10 million to 100 million different species. Uh, the, the, we've only cataloged uh, just under 2 million different plant animal uh, species. These estimates are based on how frequently we discover new species, uh, how much time we spend looking for them, so sampling effort, and then how much territory uh, like space there is uh, for these things. And then you can run statistics to figure out, okay, if, if we're spending this much time looking for it, and this is the rate that we keep finding them, then this is the total amount that there probably actually are. But these are estimates. We don't actually know how many species there are on Earth because we keep finding new ones and we, we don't know what the total is. And there are some places that we just can't access, right? Like deep, 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 parts of the ocean uh, are just like we, we can get submersibles way down there but we can only see a, a very tiny little uh, bit around that submersible we can't really uh, catalog it as nicely as we would like to it can also describe the variety of ecosystems which is ecosystem diversity so in a big landscape you might have a uh, a river over here and then you have a forest just upland of that. The ecosystem where the forest meets the river is referred to as a riparian ecosystem. The floodplain uh, towards the bottom of the hill where, where you're gonna have it uh, when it rains you get a big spread of that water is going to be a wetland ecosystem. Uphill on the mountain you might have a coniferous forest where pine trees are growing because it gets colder as you move up the hill and pine trees are better adapted for those types of climates. So you can have a variety of different ecosystems all in the same location because the abiotic factors uh, in terms of the landscape, the exposure to sunlight, the temperature, the, the air pressure and quality uh, are going to change as well. So that changes the, the micro uh, climate the, uh, and the ecosystem diversity. And it can also refer to functional diversity, which is the number of different ecosystem jobs uh, that are available. Jobs such as energy flow and matter cycling needed for the survival of biological communities. These are uh, tied up with those biogeochemical cycles that we talked about in some of the previous videos. So make sure you understand biodiversity and know it includes genetic diversity, species diversity, ecosystem diversity, and functional diversity. Now functional diversity here is alluding to another concept which is called the niche, N-I-C-H-E. An ecological niche is your job in an ecosystem, uh, but it's kind of more than that as well. It is the specific habitat uh, where a given organism is able to thrive, so it, it's the ideal location for that uh, organism where they can potentially exist, and then all of the functional jobs that they can uh, perform while in that location. So it's 
it's a, almost a description of um, if you imagine an ecosystem as a jigsaw puzzle and all the different organisms are pieces of this jigsaw puzzle. I'm sorry if this is a little abstract. The niche is a, an attempt to describe the shape of that organism's jigsaw piece. It's how they fit into the ecosystem. Oh, this is a producer that is able to live at this temperature range, at this moisture content, with this much rainfall, with this much exposure to sunlight, so it can uh, set, be at the base of these types of trees, and also has this property of returning nitrogen to the soil, which allows it to support this type of ecological community. It, it, the niche tells you how an organism fits into the ecosystem. Uh, it's usually cited as being the job of an organism. So to elaborate a little bit on these concepts, we'll talk about genetic diversity, which is the variety of different genes that a uh, given species population has. So again, a population is a group of organisms all of the same species. So the biodiversity of a species would just be talking about all the different types of genes that they have. And you could have a genetically homogenous species, one that's very, very similar. This does happen in natural populations. If you have some species and there's a natural disaster that comes through, say there's, there's a flood and it reduces the population down to a very small number of individuals, well then the genetic diversity of that population is going to be very, very small because you only have a couple of individuals uh, that, that are left. And they'll start regrowing the population, right? They'll, they'll breed together and make new uh, offspring, but then those offspring will have very few mate choices, so they will have to inbreed in order to continue uh, producing more members of the population. So the whole population will be pulling from a very small gene pool, and you would have low genetic diversity. Low genetic diversity means that certain uh, conditions like genetic diseases and things like that that would be recessive diseases, usually would show up very rarely in the population, might become a lot more common. It's not an absolute guarantee uh, that you would have a lot of problems with genetic diseases, but it becomes a lot more likely if you have low genetic diversity. We see this with uh, the royal families of Europe. Um, hemophilia is a, genetic, a recessive genetic condition uh, that is much more frequent in the royal families of Europe than it is in the majority of the human population because uh, historically, royals marry other royals, so they are uh, a much more genetically homogenous group than uh, the average human population. We also see it pop up with dog breeding because purebred dogs are inbred dogs. It's just two ways to say the same thing. You're taking a very small genetic stock and you're breeding individuals over and over and over again over many generations. And we know that a lot of purebred dog species have, say, heart conditions or are prone to, to developing cancer or have arthritis or, or something like that. It's a similar sort of issue where recessive conditions can become a lot more prevalent if you are pulling from a relatively small gene pool. So here we have some corn and you can see this white corn cob on the left. Uh, something you might not know is that every kernel of corn is a separate uh, individual. Uh, each one of these, uh, this is the the corn is the reproductive part of the of the corn plant, and every single one of these was a separate flower that was pollinated. So each one of these little kernels is a different individual. They have a different set of chromosomes. So we can see this one corn cob is pretty genetically homogenous, right? They're all this one pure pigment color, this kind of bright white color. Then we have this yellow corn with a little bit more genetic diversity, but you can see that there are different traits available. You can have white corn, we can have yellow corn, we can have purple corn. Here we have red corn. And then you have this, this kind of mismatched corn here, right? Where you can see that every one of these kernels has been pollinated possibly by different individuals. So we have different crops uh, around and there's a lot more genetic diversity. Uh, in this one, and you can see a good mix of different traits in this kern corn kernel. And what this actually uh, demonstrates is over time, humans have actually bred corn to be the way that it is. So this corn kernel on the left is an extremely uh, carefully, artificially selected human-made crop uh, that we have controlled the traits of to be bigger and bigger and bigger and get this uh, particular 
uh, pigment of uh, corn kernel. Way over here on the right, this is more what natural corn would look like out in the wild when we first came to it. Corn is it's a kind of grass, right? So it looks just like uh, grass seeds on top of it. But through deciding what kinds of traits were going to be successful breeders by breeding them, uh, we have altered the traits of that organism. Evolution works in much the same way. Whichever traits are going to lead to an organism being a successful reproducer are going to be the ones that are enhanced generation by generation, and then you can get an organism or a population at the end that looks fundamentally different. Bananas are another example of an artificially selected crop and one that uh, has very low genetic diversity these days. So uh, over on the right here you can see a banana with big seeds in it and that's what natural bananas uh, look like. They have these big chunky seeds in them and then you can see the, uh, the Cavendish banana which is what we eat. And below that, you can see a natural carrot, which is just a root, right? It just it looks like any old root. And then after many, many, many generations of artificially selecting for the ones with the largest roots, we got the carrot with uh, that we, we imagine today that Bugs Bunny would want to take a big bite out of. So how did we get this artificial selection? Well, there's a lot of diversity of traits in any given population. Some of those traits, like for the carrot, some of them caused it to have a root that was a little bit bigger. We selected those plants and we said, hey, those are the ones we're going to cultivate. Those are going to be the successful reproducers. And we bred them together and made them the only ones reproducing. And since they were the only ones reproducing, the gene pool of the next generation only had those large carrot genes. And so the average size of the carrot got bigger generation by generation. Natural selection, which is how evolution works in natural systems, works pretty much the same way. It's just that certain traits automatically make you more likely to have more offspring than your competitors. And that's what will cause uh, that trait to increase in number in future generations. Now, why is uh, having high genetic diversity going to make an ecosystem more resilient or more healthy? I'm going to use the banana as an example here. We did not always eat the Cavendish banana. We, there used to be another banana called the Gros Michel. If you've ever eaten uh, banana flavored candy, then you may notice that it doesn't actually taste anything like bananas. That's because it tastes more like the Gros Michel than it does the Cavendish. The Gros Michel was a genetic monoculture that basically every banana was a clone of every other banana. So every Gros Michel banana was exactly genetically identical to all the others. Low genetic diversity. There was, there was no alternation of traits in, the, in that banana crop. So every single banana you ate was exactly the same as every other banana. Now, there was a fungal disease that got into one of the banana trees. It got into the roots. It was called Panama disease, and it ruined that banana tree, right? It, it killed that banana tree because that banana tree was genetically weak to that fungus. Uh, it, it, was, it was almost allergic to it. It had a susceptibility to that fungal disease. But because all of the banana trees were genetic clones of all the other ones, they were, they were basically genetically identical, low genetic diversity, all of them had that same weakness. So that disease, that fungal disease, spread like wildfire and completely wiped out the Gros Michel crop such that we had to replace it with a completely new type of banana. We lost a lot of money, uh, a lot of, of economic production for banana crops for a bit till we could find a banana which was resistant to this uh, fungus and uh, was good enough tasting and large enough that it would be able to uh, sell. And that's how we have this newer uh, kind of banana. But the, the Cavendish, the banana that we eat now, is exactly the same. It's also a monoculture. Every Cavendish is a clone of every other Cavendish. They have very, very low uh, genetic diversity. They're, they're grown uh, in such a way that they're, you're not going to have any kind of variation. And if another disease comes through, then we're going to lose that banana crop as well. And this is true in natural systems. If you have low genetic diversity and some sort of disturbance comes through, if one member of the population is sensitive to that disturbance, 
all of the members of the population will be sensitive to that disturbance. However, if you have high genetic diversity, lots and lots of different traits, then it increases the likelihood that at least one or two members of your population are going to be resilient, that they're going to be able to survive and thrive uh, after that disturbance comes through. So the more diversity you have, the easier it is for a species to bounce back after anything that nature can throw at them. So that's why genetic diversity is important to ecosystem health. Species diversity, same concept. Uh, not only do we have you know, different types of organisms, but there are different types of those types of organisms. So here I have a whole bunch of different species of ducks, right? If I say duck, you probably think about a mallard duck, but there's wood ducks and, and peking ducks and all kinds uh, of different uh, ducks to look at. And they're all related to each other, right? They're all types of ducks, but each one has spread into different ecosystems. And in those ecosystems, slightly different traits are going to be useful for survival. Or maybe they've come up with a slightly different strategy uh, to be able to get their food or a slightly different strategy to be able to attract mates or to ward off predators, something like that. There are different ways of being a successful organism. And every species has a slightly different way of accomplishing its overall goal, which is to survive and reproduce. So all of these are ducks, which means they all came from one source population of duck, right? There, there is one, uh, at some point in the past, there was a, the, the proto-duck, the, the, uh, the bird that we would say is the ancestor of all ducks. And it had some offspring, and it, had, it was very successful. It had lots and lots of offspring, and those offspring went out and they spread to all these different ecosystems, right? And ducks are pretty successful. You can find them all over the world. They spread into all these ecosystems, but some ecosystems were warmer than others, some were colder than others. So different types of feathers were valuable. You know, this one needed uh, bright feathers to reflect the sun. These ones needed dark feathers to absorb the sun to be able to get more heat. These ones needed thicker feathers. These ones needed thinner feathers. Some of them needed to hide from predators because the predators were, were hunting them. That was the main thing that was preventing them from being able to get to adulthood to be able to reproduce. Others didn't have that problem, so maybe they went with bright coloration in order to be able to attract mates more easily. Some of them found food resources in these ecosystems that required long, thin bills. Others found food resources that required wide, flat bills. So in every ecosystem, the requirements, the specific requirements or the specific adaptations that made them the best adapted for that scenario were different. So every subpopulation, every population of ducks changed over time to fit those ecosystems. Uh, and in evolution, we say uh, the concept is survival of the fittest, right? But fitness does not mean athletic fitness. It doesn't mean the largest. It does not mean the toughest. It does not mean the most ferocious or, or the most aggressive or any of that kind of, of nonsense. Fitness means, sir, it, the, it should actually be, be stated like this, reproduction of the most well adapted. Whatever traits make you more likely to be able to reproduce, those are the ones that are going to show up in the gene pool of the next generation. It just makes logical sense like that. So because they spread so far, and all of the ecosystems they spread into were so different, you got different species of ducks. And indeed, organisms that are related to each other can, generation by generation, become so different looking from each other, the, the populations can become so different from each other, that if we were to bring them together, they would no longer be able to interbreed. And at that point, we say there are two different species. If you can bring two different species of ducks together, two populations of ducks together, and they can no longer produce viable offspring, then they are now two different species of ducks. So you have one population, they spread, they diversify, they evolve, you bring them together, we now have two species of ducks. Or in this case, we have five species of ducks, and there's quite a few more than that. So we've talked about genetic diversity, and now we've talked about species diversity, and you can kind of see that the variety of genes 
uh, allows you to have a variety of species. The more variety you have, the more variation you have in the genetics of a population, the more different types of species can come from that original starting population. And then when you talk about different combinations of species, you're talking about different ecosystems, so then that supports ecosystem diversity. Ecosystem diversity is the Earth's variety of deserts and grasslands and forests and mountains and oceans and lakes and rivers and wetlands as another big component of overall global biodiversity. Now, when we talk about uh, ecosystems, we can divide them into terrestrial land-based ecosystems and aquatic water-based ecosystems. Aquatic ecosystems are usually subdivided into marine and freshwater, so uh, ocean, saltwater, and uh, freshwater ecosystems, which are lakes and uh, a lot of wetlands and creeks and rivers and that sort of thing. Uh, and the terrestrial ones are usually classified based on what their dominant vegetation type is. So is it a hardwood forest, a, a, a um, uh, deciduous forest like oaks and maples and that sort of thing like we have around here? Or is it a pine forest, a coniferous forest, cone-bearing tree type forest? Or is it, uh, like you see here, shrubland uh, in a kind of wetland type area uh, on this photo on the right? As we discussed in Unit 1, the abiotic factors of any given region are going to influence what organisms are going to survive best in that locality, uh, what the temperature is, how much rainwater is available, what the pH of the soil is, what the composition of nutrients in the soil are. And then once you have the plants that are available, and remember they're classified based on the dominant vegetation, you know what kind of animals will survive there as well. So the more different types of uh, biomes that we can have, different types of ecosystems, the more diversity of species we can have as well, because every ecosystem is going to support different types of organisms. So higher ecosystem diversity gives us higher species diversity as well. They go hand in hand. Now that's on a global scale. Typically when we talk about species diversity, we're talking about uh, the variety of organisms within a single ecosystem. Now I used the word biome just a moment ago, and I, and I believe I gave you the definition in one of our Unit 1 videos. A biome is a major terrestrial zone of life. It's a category of ecosystems, essentially. So deserts are a biome. Uh, uh, wetlands are a biome. Coniferous forests are a biome. It's a, it's a kind of ecosystem. To read the definition straight from the book, it's a large region such as a forest, a desert, a grassland with a distinct climate and certain species, especially vegetation, typically occurring within them. Now what's going to actually determine what biome you have in any location is going to be a number of different factors. It's uh, latitude, uh, how, how far north and south it is, it's distance from an ocean, it's distance from a big water source, it's elevation, uh, the further uh, up you go, the, the higher in altitude you go, the lower the air pressure is going to be, and as uh, pressure drops, the temperature will also drop. It's just a property of gases, so it's typically going to get colder. So it turns out the moving up in altitude is a lot like moving north in latitude. So the more variation that a landscape has in terms of mountains and valleys and uh, you know peaks and rivers and all these kind of things, the more ecosystem diversity you're going to find in that uh, landscape. And therefore the overall biodiversity of that whole area is going to be higher. And then lastly we have functional diversity here at the bottom that we can talk about. Functional diversity refers again to this niche concept that we'll expand on a little bit more later on, but it's kind of the uh, organism's job. We talked about food chains in unit one, trophic structure. One job you might have is to be a producer. Your job is to capture energy from the sun and make it available to the other levels of the ecosystem. Another job you might have is to be an herbivore. Another job you might have is to be a carnivore, an apex predator, which keeps the populations of all of the other species uh, in check. And every member of that trophic structure is playing a role in making sure that the whole ecosystem stays in balance. For example, if we were to wipe out all of the carnivores, uh, in a particular ecosystem. Well, that means that there would be no predators left to 
eat the herbivores. So the herbivore population would suddenly start to expand because they're able to reproduce at the same rate that they always were, but now there's no, uh, there's nothing pecking them off. So their death rate has dropped while their birth rate has remained the same. So their population is going to increase. That means that their overall rate of food consumption is going to increase because there's more and more and more members of their population. So they're going to expand and the number of plants uh, that they are consuming is going to increase. So the population of producers is going to drop pretty drastically as the herbivore population skyrockets, the producers are going to drop. Uh, and then suddenly there will be no producers, no plants left because the herbivores have eaten all of them. And then if the herbivores eat themselves out uh, of their own ecosystem. They, they deplete all of the food. There's no food left for their now massive population. And then you get a population crash. So the carnivores are actually serving the role of making sure that the herbivore population stays below a certain amount, which serves the purpose of making sure that the plants stay at a certain amount. Everything is being kept in balance by all of the other portions of that trophic structure. And there are other jobs that organisms can do in the ecosystem as well. We have these dung beetles, which are part of the cleanup crew of an ecosystem. They are managing, they are taking any kind of waste and they are rolling it up and they are utilizing it uh, for themselves. We have these beavers, which are ecosystem engineers. They can cut down trees and build dams and they can change an ecosystem from a forested ecosystem to a wetland ecosystem. So they can completely alter the entire landscape uh, of an ecosystem. They can change what kinds of physical factors are there and therefore change what kinds of species can actually survive in that location. So ecosystem engineers is what beavers are frequently referred to as. These are all jobs that organisms can have in an ecosystem. Now, the variety of different jobs available, that's referred to as the functional diversity. And it's really good if uh, you have a number of different species, all of which could do any given job. So if you have um, a whole a big variety of different plants at the producer level, such that say a disease comes through and it wipes out all of one kind of plant, you have other plants in that ecosystem that could fill in uh, as the herbivore's main diet in that situation. If you have a nice diverse number of species able to fulfill any given niche in the ecosystem, any given role, any given job in that ecosystem, then any disturbance that comes through, any kind of thing that could happen, the ecosystem will be resilient. It'll be able to bounce back because someone, some species can fill in any given role. If a bunch of farmers get upset uh, about uh, the, the wolf population and they start hunting the wolves and they disappear and you have coyotes still in the area that can fulfill the role of apex predators, the ecosystem will be able to, uh, to manage uh, that situation. To be clear, the loss of a species is still going to decrease overall biodiversity, which is going to make the ecosystem less resilient as a whole. But as long as you have a few different species that can fulfill any given task, there's going to be some flexibility uh, to that ecosystem. It's, it's going to be able to adapt a little bit to any kind of disturbance that could go through, say wildfires or disease or um, clear-cutting vegetation or hunting or any of those kind of factors.